that it's moving, that it's rotating around a black hole, there is an effect that it's called blanford sanai process, that it's a way in which you can extract and rotational energy from the black hole and put, thanks to the magnetic fields, and put this into kinetic energy. Um, it's something that is quite uh, analogous to the Penrose mechanism, if you are a bit familiar with. Uh, what is the idea? Here it's just sketched. Imagine for the black hole, well, it could be also mass and neutral star. Anyway, there is a surface and there are field, fields line that comes from, uh, from the disk outside. Okay, so you have the central object and the fields line. You have, for example, an intense poloidal magnetic fields and the field lines terminate. They just attach with the, the horizon of the central object. Uh, why it's analog to the Penrose process? Because the Penrose process tells you that if you are inside the so-called black hole ergosphere, even any um, inertial frame feels the drag due to the spin and it must rotate. It's impossible to have something that is not rotating inside the ergosphere. That's the basic also of the Penrose mechanism. Here it happens the same. The lines, the field lines inside the ergosphere cannot be at rest with respect to the lines that are outside. They must anyway rotate. And the typical rotation speed are of the order of half of the black hole spin or black hole, uh, uh, the, speed, uh, the angular speed of the horizon. So what happens is that if you just let the central object to rotate, this will wind up the magnetic field lines. So if you start from an intense poloidal magnetic fields, this winding due to this uh, lenford snyder effect will just produce an intense pol uh, toroidal component because now it's on the field direction. But if you wind up fields, if you remember from your basic uh, lecture, um, whenever you have a field, a vectorial field, and you just wind it up, the, you have a lot of lines. And a lot of lines means that the field is growing its intensity. So the magnetic pressure here grows, and grows up to the points where it can actually push matter outside. This is the very basic. And of course, we must conserve energy. Where do this energy come from? It comes from the kinetic energy of the rotational energy of the black hole, similar to the Penrose mechanism. We are converting kinetic rotational energy of the black hole into kinetic energy of the jet using the magnetic fields. Sounds simple, it's a nightmare. I think uh, very few people all over the world understood the black hole scenario mechanism and it's still very debate. It's a solution of the Einstein equation under some assumption, but there are now simulations in numerical relativity that seem to support it as a plausible mechanism. Uh, this was actually introduced by Blanford and Sanayik in 1977 uh, and it has been uh, recently explored, so it's a process of Chekhovskoy, McKinney and others did calculation. Neutrino are also a possible second way to power this kind of thing. You, have, you remember, we have already seen this picture, but now we will just think about this. The neutrino will actually be emitted from this region and from the central object and uh, they can actually collide. If you make a neutrino and neutrino collision, there is a certain probability that you produce an electron positron pair. This reaction is uh, more favorite in the pole because the cross section, I will show you later, it has a dependence on the collision angle. If the neutrino and anti neutrino are parallel, the cross section becomes zero. If the neutrino and anti neutrino just do something like that, you get the maximum of the cross section. Here, because of the geometry, it seems that you are actually in a good situation because you have let's say, even the relativistic beaming and you could have neutrino doing something like that. So this was introduced at the end of the 80s by Hackler and collaborators. Um, there have been calculations that try to compute this quantity here. I would say that the kind of the amount of energy that we, we computed was compatible with the, sh with the short gamma reversed, but on the low side. So it seems that we have only marginally enough energy to produce. So it could be that it's a viable mechanism, but it's maybe really, really at the threshold. So it's not robust, I would say. Um, it's more efficient if the central object do not collapse, it's here. However, as we said, the more you keep the central object, the more you will pollute your environment. So the problem with this mechanism is that if you want to have it efficient, you need a central object. But if you have the central object, you will have a lot of winds, you will have a lot of baryonic pollution. And we know that the baryonic pollution is a killer because it won't make the jet become relativistic. This has been explored, for example, in this work by Oliver Hughes and collaborators. What they did is that they took the result from a simulation 
uh, of, for example, here of black hole neutron star. So here you have the black hole in the center, and you have the disk, and they let it evolve for one second, two second, in a code that includes neutrino transport and neutrino annihilation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, here there were. Uh, Wait, this is uh, actually binary neutron star merger, yes. This is a neutron star against the neutron star. So there is the formation of a jet, but the jet don't become relativistic. So the jet is formed, but it's uh, sub-relativistic. So it won't, it won't be able to do um, a gamma reverse. They repeated the experiment with a black hole neutron star system. So this is now the black hole. And now you, you, we manage doing the, the relativistic jet. If you just look at the logarithm of the gamma factor, it's on the order of a few hundreds. Why we manage in the black hole neutron star case and we didn't manage in the BNS case? Because in the BNS case, when the star collides, they pollute the environment much more. The ejecta is equatorial, but it's also polar. And on the pole, you deposit two uh, you have too many baryons, and the baryons will just make your jet too heavy, and you cannot reach a relativistic speed. <coughs> um, uh, this should have been here. Okay. Um, sorry, I just uh, put the slides in the wrong order. Let's start from here. Um, I told you that Blanford's and I mechanism could be a viable uh, mechanism. Uh, but I told you that in the fireball, we make the assumption that the magnetic field has a density much lower than the kinetic energy and the rest mass energy of the jet. Okay, we can actually change this assumption. What happens if the magnetic field is strong enough such that we have a so-called pointing flux dominated magnetic jet? So the jet is dominated not by the baryon or by the kinetic energy of the baryon, but of the magnetic energy of, of the field. So it means that this ratio is much larger than one. Then the physics change quite a lot. We, uh, we have the jet that expand. It's driven by the magnetic pressure. And uh, the, there are several possible mechanisms that can actually uh, change the field configuration. They are called recognition, reconnection mechanism. And they could actually produce immediately the particle that you see as a gamma rays. Uh, there are several way in, this, in which this uh, uh, process can happen. Uh, one is that you really extract like a spin down mechanism, so you have a rotating uh, dipole, and then similar to what happens in pulsar, you can think about extracting this in the form of wind nebula, for example. There are some energy model, and there are even more complicated things where you combine the internal collision. So I would say that it's not clear uh, and even inside the community that, uh, do, that do think that the origin of the GRB is a magnetic origin, uh, there is no clear consensus on what could be the idea. The take-home message here is simply that it could, since we have strong magnetic fields, there could be a mechanism, a way to extract this directly without invoking the formation of a black hole, but still keeping the, the massive neutral star in the center and just extracting the kinetic energy of the uh, massive neutral star into the magnetic fields. And then it's possible that at a large scale, the magnetic fields change configuration and this produces some part. I don't want to go too much in the details, okay, I just want to give you some argument, time scale argument. The first one is that, okay, to do this kind of job, we need strong magnetic fields. We need magnetic fields amplification, which are the possibility to amplify magnetic fields in a binary star collision. There are actually two major ways. One is the so-called kelvin elements instabilities, where the two star uh, touches each other, there is this uh, kelvin elements instability that develops, and inside these vortices, the magnetic field can grow up, potentially up to equipartition, which means 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 gauss locally. Of course, it's a local field. Uh, and this happens on a much smaller time scale of the order of 1 millisecond. Um, of course, the magnetic fields, as I, as I said before, answering one of, uh, one of the questions, could be local and could be very disordered. It's also possible, even if it's not clear how it could happen, that the magnetic fields become also large-scale magnetic fields. Remember, with the magnetic fields, you don't have only to care about the intensity. You need also to care about the topology of the magnetic fields. You could have a very intense magnetic fields that has no structure, 
right? Okay, so the fluid element is pointing here, another is pointing there, another is pointing there, another is pointing there. And if you look from the outside, there is no net magnetic field. But if all the fluid elements somehow align, then if you look from the outside, you will see, for example, a nice dipole, okay? This kind of alignment could happen on the so-called Alphabet time scale, which is, depends on the magnetic field structure, it's larger than that, but it's not dramatically large. Could be a fraction of a second. And there are some simulations that seems to point to that. Uh, it's very challenging to simulate these kind of things. You need to do some ideal or even better some resistive MHD. This is the first simulation that seems, one well, of the first simulation, or even the first simulation that seems to show an incipient point in flux dominating jet, but there are still a lot of uncertainties. Um, this happens, of course, both in the blanford sanaya case and uh, in the uh, magnetic driven case. In case of the blanford sanaya we can compute what is the luminosity that we can extract from that. If you read the original blanford sanaya paper, they already put some scaling relations. So the blanford sanaya luminosity will depend on the mass of the core, on the intensity of the polar component of the magnetic fields, and on how fast is the black hole rotating. So this omega h is just the um, angular velocity of the black hole at the horizon, and this depends on the curve parameter of your black hole. Um, if you now just assume that the magnetic field goes to equipartition, you get an upper limit, and uh, it, it comes out, a result that has a, a, a very intuitive meaning. This is the m dot. m dot is the accretion rate. This simple estimate tells you that the upper limit of the blanford sanayev mechanism is actually the uh, accretion power, okay? So, in some sense, the blanford sanayev mechanism is taking the rest mass energy of the disk and it's converting it into a jet with a certain efficiency that turns out to be of the order of 1% if we try to combine this model with, uh, with observation, okay? The kind of kinetic energy, it's of course the blanford sanayev mechanism times the time scale of the disk accretion, and we are in a safe range, 10 to the 51. So it's uh, compatible with all short gamma reverse that we have observed. This is only you know, back of the envelope calculation, but I think this scaling relation are quite, quite useful. Um, we could do also some estimate for the neutrino annihilation mechanism. Uh, there, this is the complicated formula that I spoke to you before. If you want to compute the neutrino annihilation rate, you have to compute this integral where you see again our neutrino typical cross section, the coupling constant of the weak interaction. These are the neutrino intensity. It's very complicated because you have to think about every neutrino coming from every place, meeting neutrino coming from every other place with all possible orientation. It's a very cumbersome integral. Uh, we have computed it and actually you can find that there is a pretty nice uh, um, uh, parameterization of the integral of this quantity where you put all this constant here and then it's just proportional to the product of the neutrino luminosity which is makes sense in some sense, right? Because you are computing neutrino annihilation and so you, you do expect that the amount of energy that you deposit it's proportional to the product of the electron neutrino times the electron neutrino annihilation. Uh, anyway, if you compute things, you will end up with 10 to the 49, 10 to the 50 Earth per second. This is one order of magnitude smaller than the blanford sanayev In this sense, the blanford sanayev mechanism is more robust. It gives you always enough energy. Neutrino, they are only marginal. Um, yeah, this is what I wanted to say. This is a little bit more technical. Um, so, this more or less concludes what I wanted to say about the energy, the engine. I would say that if you feel a bit confused, don't worry. I think uh, the world community feels a bit confused about uh, the engine, in the sense that people have investigated this since many years, and there is no still clear picture, a lot of possible mechanism with a lot of uh, uncertainty, so it's still an open field. Of course, we hope that now that we are sure that it's binary to star merger or local to star merger, we will have, you know, less uncertainty and we can really try to, ex to dig a bit more into this problem, but it's still open. Uh, now I want to speak a bit more about the jet propagation and yeah. Uh, so, as I said, let's try to put the two things together. There is a merger, the merger pollutes the environment, 
There is a central engine in the middle that, through some uh, mysterious magic mechanism, is able to deposit a lot of energy on a time scale of hundreds of kilometers, a lot of energy, that wants to expand into a jet. When the jet expands, we have to remember that it's not expanding in vacuum. It's expanding in an environment that has been polluted by the ejecta. So people have started now working on what is the feature of a jet, of a GRB jet, that it's expanding, for example, inside the dynamical ejecta or the wind ejecta. And this is actually the result. This is a simulator from David Alzati, for example. Uh, here is the jet that is expanding. This is uh, the uh, ejecta. At the beginning, the ejecta helps. So this is the jet base. This is the so-called jet head that has a forward shock and a reverse shock. You see, at the beginning, the, the ejecta tends to help keeping the jet coordinated. But uh, uh, as, as time goes on and as you go to larger scale, the, the pressure is no more able to confine the jet. And so there is some matter, that, some energy that actually flow from the jet to the environment. This was actually discovered in... It's a very um, deep thing in the sense that people have seen this in long gamma reversed in short gamma reversed, but even in AGM. So even when you have a supermassive black hole that is just uh, uh, shooting a jet into a galaxy and even outside of the galaxy, people have seen this cocoon that is just a dissipation of a part of the kinetic energy of the jet into the ambient. So it's a very broad thing that happens at a very different scale. It's still pretty much unsolved problem, but... Uh, uh, and um, this happens on the xy plane of the binary? No, that's the same. That's x and... Yeah, this y is actually... Is, uh, is ah, okay. So, okay. okay. No, no, it's, uh, it's happening on the, on the polar axis. Um, and this is more or less the, the origin of this cocoon. So a cocoon, or if you want, some people call it cocoon, some people call it structure jet. And uh, why am I telling you about that? Because um, I told you that after the detection of GW170817, we have seen a gamma reverse. Okay. I didn't tell you much about that gamma reverse. Let's have a look at the data. This is actually the redshift as a function of the redshift, and this is the energy, uh, I think it's the, let's say, isotropized energy, if you want. Um, these are the long gamma reverse, these are the short gamma reverse, and this is GW170817 gamma reverse. There are two facts that are very important. It's the closest that we have observed so far, and it's the dimmer. These two things really crashes and into each other, because if you expect a gamma reverse close by, you should see a lot of energy. Why did we see something that is very faint? Well, in some sense, it's, it's also logical, because if it's faint, you can see it also if you are close by. However, people at the beginning started to say, but is it a real short gamma reverse, or we are observing something else? And actually, from the discovery paper of where they first comment on this gamma reverse, they, uh, you can see that they were already trying to give an answer to that. The idea is that we did not observe a gamma reverse point toward us, because it's something that I didn't say before. We don't always observe a gamma reverse. We observe a gamma reverse only if the jet is pointing toward us. Otherwise, the gamma rays will just get. <coughs> so the gamma rays are really confined in a region that is very close to the cone. However, an explanation that worked, uh, that in the end worked uh, well in this case, is that we were not looking at the jet inside the jet, but we were a bit lateral. So here is the jet, and here is the viewing angle. It was clear from the detection already that the jet is not something that it's moving in free space because otherwise we would have observed something very different. People started to think about these two different models. In one case, the jet has a, a lateral structure, it's called the structure jet scenario, and we were just looking, so the earth, the earth is somewhere here, and the, our line of sight is not at the head of the jet, but it's more lateral or the so-called cocoon scenario. The cocoon scenario, if you remember, there is here the jet that is very powerful in the center that produces, due to the pressure balance, that produces a cocoon where it deposits the energy. It turned out that these two models are practically equivalent. You can call the structure jet the cocoon and somehow it's 
I, I don't want to minimize things. But it turns out to be a matter of language and of the paternity of the idea. But the idea is that anyway, the take-home message for you is that you don't have to think about gamma reverse jet as really you know, cone that expands into space, but you have to think about a complex structure that must interact with some uh, environment and give some of this energy to the environment, making a structure jet, or if you want to. Um, yeah, this is all I wanted to say about uh, uh, the gamma reverse. The final two or three slides, it's really quite simple, uh, it's about the afterglow. If you remember, when I commented the afterglow, I told you the, the, the jet is a lot of kinetic energy, right? We dissipate uh, a good fraction of this kinetic energy into internal shocks in the fireball models, and this gives us the prompt emission. However, this does not stop the jet. The, st the jet is still moving because it has a lot of kinetic energy. And then the jet will propagate into the interstellar medium, right? And this will give another uh, emission that is called the afterglow emission. For the ejecta, especially for the dynamical ejecta, the situation is very similar. The dynamical ejecta will undergo, will undergo nucleosynthesis, are processed nucleosynthesis, they will be the kilonova, however the kilonova will not stop the ejecta. The ejecta will continue expanding, and this expanding ejecta will start interacting with the interstellar medium producing shocks. This shock will dissipate energy, this dissipation of energy will produce local magnetic fields, and the electrons will just move in these magnetic fields, making synchrotron emission. So these very two different things, the slowdown of the jet and the, the slowdown of the kilonova, they produce a very similar emission that it's a typical synchrotron emission. In one case, it's the afterglow. In the other case, it's the synchrotron emission from the dynamic jet. There is still no short name for that. But it's, sometimes it's called the, the radio transient. It depends with whom you are speaking with. Um, so the idea here is simple. You have the jet. Here there has been the prompt emission, but the jet continues. The jet interact with the interstellar medium, it produces some shocks here. The electrons get accelerated by the shock and they start, uh, they start then uh, emitting synchrotron radiation. Um, this problem has been solved at uh, various levels, so there is an analytic solution, some uh, <coughs> scaling, simple scaling relations, so there is a acceleration that happens when the, the shock has encountered uh, a mass comparable to the mass that is in the jet. Somehow it's the physics very similar to the one of remnants. If you are familiar with the core collapse of type 1A remnants, it's a similar thing. So you have a, a free expansion that uh, you have the deceleration onset, then you have a state of self-similar solution with a state of Taylor expansion. This has been modeled. The important thing here is that when you enter the state of Taylor, the deceleration region, the angle of the jet expands. So, why the gamma reverse and the prompt emission are very collimated and they just emit along the jet. In the case of the afterglow, because the ejecta expand, it's no more collimated, then you expect, uh, uh, let's say, emission over the wall pi. This is one of the reasons why this is actually a weaker uh, emission. Moreover, um, yeah, this is just to show you the basic mechanism of, so uh, when, when the interstellar medium crosses the shock, there is a jump in density, here there is the formation of strong magnetic fields and the electron starts to move uh, right and left, right and left inside this uh, amplified magnetic fields so they get a nice power law and if you just plug in this distribution of electrons with this power law you will get just a synchrotron uh, radiation that they just explain the very complicated spectrum. So there is a wall, I mean, sorry to be a bit fast on that but uh, it's not my topic so I don't feel extremely comfortable I just want to say that even the analysis of the afterglow it's uh, probably as large as the analysis of the short gamma reverse and uh, people have reached a, a rather good control I would say more with phenomenological uh, model because it's uh, extremely complicated but the basic physics that I showed you before uh, is actually the dominant physics so, uh, magnetic field amplification, electrons get this uh, power law distribution and this gives us a synchrotron emission that powers first an X-ray emission, then we go into the visible and then finally on the radio modulated times. Exactly the same things happens for, from the dynamical ejecta. Um, for example, this has been, for example, uh, 
Kenta Otokizaka, with uh, Sleepy Run, for example, has explored this in uh, details. What I think it's nice from their paper is that they also provide um, order of magnitude and scaling relation, and for the typical value of the density and the velocity and the energy that we expect, you will see that this kind of uh, transit should have uh, a time scale of the peak of the order of a few years. So this is a sort of prediction in the sense that it could be that in the radio, because this, the kind of peak that we get here is in the radio, uh, we will be able, hopefully, in a few years, if we point our, our telescope to where uh, GW 170817 was located, we hope to see maybe some radio emission. Why, as a theoretical physicist, as a, uh, this could actually be relevant? Because this is crucially dependent on the energy and on the velocity of the ejecta. In particular, it turns out that it's the high energy tail of the dynamical ejecta that produces this transient. Okay, so you can emit, I don't know, 10 to the minus 3 solar masses of dynamical ejecta, but if you emit a fraction of this ejecta with a lot of kinetic energy, this tail, this high energy, high velocity, high energy tail of the dynamical ejecta is actually the one that is powering this radio emission. Now the question is, do all our models produce this high energy tail? The answer is no. It depends on the equation of state. Okay. Here, for example, you see these are results from four different simulations, the same uh, system, 1.35, 1.35 solar mass uh, binary merger, with four different equations of state, all relativistic mean field. You see the distribution of the eject as a function of the velocity, and you see that there are some equations of state that has much larger tail compared with others that have a much smaller tail. This kind of transient comes from this state here. So, if you vary the equation of state, so the, the blue line is actually the one that is here purple, and the uh, yellow line is the one that is here blue. So, going from the purple to the blue, so from the mismatch of the color, you have very different flux. So, the very good message here is that even a few years after a, a, a binary neutral star merger, we could actually potentially be able to detect a radio transient that could say something about the property of nuclear matter that of the merger that happened a few years later. I think this is really a very good take-home message. It's very speculative, but I think it's uh, clearly you know, a good example of uh, how much the dynamics of the strong field that happens at the merger could have an impact for years in the electromagnetic field. And this brings me to my conclusion. I have uh, give you a bit exhausting um, introduction about uh, the uh, kind of uh, the most common electromagnetic counterpart that uh, we expect to be associated with compact binary merger. We have to deal with the system that is intrinsically uh, with a large variability because we could have black hole star, we could have star, different masses, we have the uncertainty of the equation of state, we still don't really control all the details of the modeling, so we could have really large variety of properties, but the take-home message is that they always can tell something about what has happened deep inside a few kilometers length scale where the dominant interaction was gravity, where really we can test, for example, general relativity. The modeling is crucial because uh, at the moment we have a good understanding because uh, somehow things turn out to be, when, when, when we have search W17, weight 17, several things a posteriori, we could say that we have expected, of course, we had many more chances, but what we have observed was actually still plausible. But I do, I do think that substantial progress must be done. There are more actually open questions on the, on the table than answered at the moment. But I hope that the multi-messenger perspective, so the possibility to combine different gravitational waves with uh, all kinds of electromagnetic counterparts will actually give us the possibility to really dig and to say something very useful about, for example, so, uh, property of space-time or property of the equation of state. Okay, this more or less concludes what I wanted to say. If you have questions concerning this last part, maybe, yeah.
in a paper that you also mentioned, the Kutubadis is between the South Pacific. Uh, joint constraints shows that there are some uh, Christian states that rule out, but some of them are very close to the border. Yeah. I mean that how is the uncertainty from the electromagnetic parts that we can still take to account some of the equations say that they are not so far, not so steep, so, so. Yes. 